Good evening. My name is Claire Schofield and I'm the director of the business school here at the University of Wolverhampton. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to join the Chartered Management Institute and the University of Wolverhampton to this, the 27th annual Crystal Lecture. The Crystal Lecture is the highlight of our events calendar and it comes at the end of the calendar year but at the beginning of the academic year. And it encourages me to look forward to the future because we have welcomed new and returning students to the business school. And it is exciting to think about what they will go on to achieve during their studies and upon graduation. And it also encourages me to reflect on the year. When I stood on the lectern last year to open the 2019 Crystal Lecture, I could not have imagined what challenges 2020 would present to us all. Like many of you joining us this evening, you'll have faced many personal and professional challenges and learn just how resourceful you and your team are and, you, and how difficult managing change actually is. And like many of you during the pandemic, you'll have realised the importance of partnership and friendship. And this evening is a celebration not only of the success of our students, who are the business leaders of the future, but also of our partnership with the CMI. I am absolutely delighted that Helen accepted our invitation to be our speaker this evening. Helen is a highly respected and accomplished global leader. And like you, I'm really looking forward to her insights on inclusivity in a post-COVID world. And before we welcome Helen this evening, we will be awarding the Rose Bowl And it's for the best performing MBA student. So without further ado, may I welcome Dilshad Sheikh, Chair of the Chartered Management Institute, West Midlands and Northwest Board, to introduce our finalists. Welcome, Dilshad. Thank you, Claire. So on behalf of the CMI, I'd like to welcome you all to this, as Claire's already said, the 27th Crystal Lecture. Now, I haven't been here for 27 years, but I've certainly been involved in the last four events. Um, and it's really interesting in that, you know, the guest speakers, they've been absolutely fantastic. We've got a brilliant speaker for you tonight. But also something that I've realised over the last four years is the intensity of competition with the MBA students. And this year it was really difficult to choose the winner. But of course, there can only be one winner. I thought it'd be interesting just to share with you how the CMI board, so I was there with my board members, how we went about, um, you know, I guess, choosing the winner. Um, just to mention that with regards to the academic marking and assessment, it's the Wolverhampton MBA team that very much look at um, the content, the strategic frameworks, the theoretical frameworks. My role with my board is very much to look at the practical elements um, with regards to the dissertations and the nominations and presentations that were submitted. So as you can imagine, representing the CMI, we very much look at leadership and management and whether the nominated candidates, um, you know, what have they learned, what have they developed, how have they changed whilst doing their dissertation? And of course, the presentation is an opportunity um, to question that. Um, and like I said, the competition this year was really, really intense. 
Um, the panel had a few squabbles, disagreements, what have you, but we did eventually arrive at a winner. So first of all, if I could just name the shortlisted candidates. So in terms of the shortlist, the first candidate was Jonathan Jobbins. We then had um, Lizzie Dibble, and we also had uh, we also had um, uh, Lisa up Lego. Um, clearly, like I said, that it was really, really challenging in terms of the dissertations, the content, the presentations, the way the three students articulated. Um, however, we did agree after some considerable time of deliberation that this year's crystal trophy will go to Lizzie Dibble. So Lizzie, I hope you're there. Um, hopefully um, we'll get the, the trophy sent out to you. But on behalf of the CMI board, really wanted to congratulate you. You delivered an outstanding presentation. Your responses to our pretty challenging questions were really positive. Um, and again, my congratulations go to you. So without further ado, what I'd like to do now is introduce our guest speaker um, for tonight. You've already heard the profile. So in terms of um, handing you over now to Helen Sylvester, Regional Director, Americas, British Council, who will be presenting her thoughts on inclusivity in a post-COVID world. So over to you, Helen. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Dilshad. And well done, Lizzie. And indeed, well done to all the shortlisted uh, group. Um, good afternoon or good evening, as it probably is for you. Uh, as Dilshad said, I'm Helen, uh, and I'm delighted to be talking to you today about equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, I have to say before we start, I'm more than 7,000 miles away from most of you, but I've got a little gizmo here that apparently is going to let me control the slides. I don't know whether that's going to work, but should it not, then we have the lovely Natasha in the background who's going to help me uh, with the slides. Uh, but I'd like to thank the Chartered Management Institute and the University of Wolverhampton for this lovely opportunity. As it says in the blurb, I'm going to, to reflect today on why EDI is important to me, why I think it should be important to all of us, um, and how new ways of working, particularly post-COVID, are surfacing new EDI challenges, but also opportunities for us as leaders and managers. Um, Natasha, can we have the foot? There we are. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, when I was a little girl, somebody asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, like they do. And I said I wanted to be a holiday courier or, or rep in another country. And even at this young age, I knew that I wanted to work internationally. And as a half Irish working class girl from Birmingham, that's the only job I knew about, bar for international spy, of course. In secondary school, I was able to pursue my interest in language and culture through study of French and German. I was fascinated by the strange and beautiful sounds of other languages, the way sentences were constructed and the extraordinarily exotic life that La Famille Bertillon and Hans and Lisa Lotter seemed to live in their respective French and German textbook worlds. And so to higher study. Nobody in my family had been to university before, so my parents were super proud when I said that I wanted to study in higher education. I didn't even consider universities because having visited a couple, I just didn't feel that I fitted in. So I looked at polytechnics and my first choice was Wolverhampton, which offered a really interesting sounding course in European studies. And apart from having great fun, my course at Wolverhampton stretched me, opened my mind in new ways and gave me extended opportunity to engage with another culture through a year spent studying in Toulouse in France. I graduated in 1985 and shortly afterwards, I was thrilled to land my first job overseas. Yes, as a holiday rep, 
So there I was living the dream. I spent six months as a holiday rep in a, a campsite near Nice, south of France. I confess it wasn't quite as glamorous as the 10 year old me had imagined. And while I enjoyed looking after the families and helping them with their linguistic and cultural questions, putting up the tents and cleaning all those toilets wasn't quite what I had been dreaming about. But it did convince me that working overseas was what I really wanted to do. And so I got myself a qualification as an English language teacher and a job in Lisbon, Portugal, followed by work as a teacher and teacher training, trainer for voluntary service overseas in Thailand. Uh, and then following a master's in education in Leeds, I started working for the British Council as a lecturer in a pedagogical faculty of a university in the Czech Republic. Since then, I have been very, very lucky to have had various senior roles that have involved me working with wonderful people in more than 40 countries. So that's my story. What's that got to do with how EDI is important to me? Well, firstly, it's important to me because it's about creating opportunity. I've experienced firsthand the difference that being given opportunity can make. My story is that of somebody who's had a great career, very luckily, but it all started with that opportunity to take a degree. When I started higher education, Around 70,000 students in the UK graduated with a first degree, albeit at universities, a few more, obviously, if you count polys. Um, and just over a third of those were women. Last year, there were around 425,000 graduating, more than half of whom were women. So things have definitely got better. But at that time, Wolverhampton Polytechnic provided truly life-changing opportunities for non-traditional learners like me. And the strength in EDI continues. So to give a little plug here to my alma mater, uh, of the close to 20,000, 23,000 students at the University of Wolverhampton, more than 60% are women, more than 50% identify as black, Asian, and uh, ethnic minority. Um, and more than 60% come from the local area. And at a time when UUK has just published guidance recommending that universities do more to tackle uh, racial harassment, it's great that the university has recently been recognised nationally for its commitment to race equality in winning a Race Equality Charter Bronze Award by Advance HE. The second thing my story illustrates about the importance of EDI to me is the international connection. It's in my view impossible to be successful in working with people from different cultures without actively demonstrating respect for, interest in and receptiveness to their backgrounds. So EDI has been important to me for my entire uh, for my entire uh, life. Sorry, I've just been handed a sheet of paper. I'll come to this in a minute about life inter interrupting. I've just been handed a, people, a piece of paper that says every time I move a, a paper, it's really noisy. I will try and be quieter. Um, in the British Council, our very purpose is to strengthen connections, build understanding and trust between people in the, other, in the UK and other cultures. So we believe that equality, diversity and inclusion are integral to our brand, reputation, success, business sustainability and impact. Uh, and I think EDI should be important to all of us uh, in terms of for business, in terms of our legal responsibilities, but also morally. Let's take the business case for EDI. McKinsey in their recent diversity wins report find that companies in the top quartile of gender diversity on executive teams are 25% more likely 
to experience above average profitability than peer companies in the bottom quartile. Similarly, in terms of ethnic diversity, companies in the top quartile of ethnic diversity on executive teams outperformed those in the bottom quartile by 36% in terms of profitability. And this works in terms of the public sector too. Um, research conducted into the business impact of EDI on the British Council found, for example, that EDI leads to increased staff confidence, self-esteem and job satisfaction, supporting the organisational effectiveness and efficiency of the British Council. EDI helps the British Council to create a values-led organisation which talented people aspire to join and are proud to work for and less willing to leave. Externally, a key source of the British Council's brand reputation and more widely its soft power impact for the UK is its ability to contribute to and influence these EDI debates and agendas globally at a senior level. And further, we're finding that multilateral donors are increasingly sponsoring programmes focused on issuing uh, on issues addressing equality and inclusion in marginalised and vulnerable groups. And EDI is also becoming a, com a common element of almost all major government and multilateral contract tenders. As for the legal case, we are all, of course, bound by the 2010 Equality Act in the UK and need to make sure that people are protected from discrimination. We will also take into account international law, uh, the legislation in the countries in which we operate, but also uh, legislation such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But ticking legal boxes is not sufficient to develop a diverse and inclusive organisation. We also have a moral case. It's just the right thing to do. In the British Council, as with good organisations everywhere, we believe it's important to value everyone and to be fair and respectful, whether they are an employee, participate in or contribute to our work and irrespective of their background and characteristics. We try to focus on what we have in common and what joins us as global citizens, rather than how we differ and what separates us. But of course, like other organisations, we don't always get it right either. So how do we turn all of these good intentions into tangible results? Well, firstly, I think we have to say that there aren't always even good intentions. Progress on diversity indicators for the private sector overall has been slow. As many as a third of companies have no gender diversity in their executive teams at all. That said, since the murder of George Floyd, major companies have pledged billions to tackle race inequality. And there has been a massive drive recently to increase ethnic diversity on executive boards. Perhaps driven by findings such as that in the USA, uh, that 53% of 18 to 34 year olds said they would not work for a firm that failed to speak out during Black Lives Matter protests. So maybe the tide is turning. However, good intentions are one thing, but results are another. What gets in the way of good results? Well, one challenge is that organisations often rely on what Urs Bilgin has called individualisation, an approach that supposes that change will happen as a result of individuals in an organisation changing their behaviour. Now, of course, awareness raising, unconscious bias, uh, competency development are vital tools in the development of an organisation's equality, diversity and inclusion agenda. And they give people a real sense that they are making a difference. But I would argue that in and of themselves, they are insufficient in delivering results.
I think there are four main things that we need to consider if we're really serious about moving to results. Firstly, organisations need robust data about the diversity, or lack thereof, of their teams to know where they're starting from. They then need to set clear strategic goals based on targets. Leaders across the board need to take ownership of and be held to account for delivery of EDI goals. They need to be properly trained and have clear deliverables. The next one is we really need to start challenging how we do things around here. I was reading an Economist article over the weekend about renewed drives for EDI. One person quoted compared organisations to fish ponds and said that adding a couple of different coloured fish isn't really going to make much of a difference. You need to change the water in the pond. And that can be relatively simple. Uh, in our office in Brazil, for example, uh, five years ago, we changed the agency that we used to hire, hire interns uh, to one that reached students in class C and D universities where young people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds went. And that made a palpable difference to the diversity of our team. Um, and the final thing that I think we need to do to move from good intentions to results is, is to really look at and have systems and for monitoring and measuring our performance. Just as we have tools and systems for monitoring and measuring business performance, we need the same to measure our performance in EDI. In the British Council, we have an equality screening and impact assessment tool to test our decisions and processes at all levels, from planning to evaluation, um, to check if and how policies or decisions might it, uh, adversely affect different groups of colleagues. The idea is that every stage we stop and question the decision that we're about to make. Uh, we also use a diversity assessment framework which helps us measure the extent to which diversity is embedded or mainstreamed into all aspects of our work. Um, we find these tools to be very helpful, though of course in practice uh, there is much more we can do to make sure that they are universally implemented. Oh, this is where I think, Natasha, you might have to help me move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So when we come to, when we come to looking at translating EDI policies and strategies to effective international practice, um, as the world is increasingly interconnected and we work across borders, translating EDI policies and strategies into effective international practice can be a challenge. What we do know, however, is that equality, diversity and inclusion are valued globally. Um, the British Council's own polling has consistently revealed that the most important value that young people all over the world think should be supported and encouraged is equality and diversity. The data gathered from 18 to 35 year olds across the G20 shows that 30% of them identify equality and diverse diversity as the most important value to them. But being seen to export EDI poses dangers as well. It risks perceptions that, after centuries of colonial relationships, the UK, or perhaps the West, has now simply shifted the moral goalposts, lecturing about or imposing a new set of values on sometimes more traditional societies in what amounts to a neo-colonial mindset and approach. We must navigate these dangers carefully, and I think a story might best illustrate how this is done. The British Council, in partnership with the British Film Institute, makes five LGBTQI plus themed short films available for the world to watch online for free during the BFI Fair Flair Film Festival each year. Through our global network of more than 100 countries, 
we encourage people to watch the films in solidarity with LGBTQI plus communities in places where freedom and equal rights are limited. Since 2015, more than 15 million people have viewed at least one of these films in 200 countries and principalities, including many parts of the world where homosexuality is criminalised. So how do we do this without being neo-colonial or putting people in danger? Well, we consider it very carefully if we're going to do anything at all and how we're going to do this. In one country, for example, where <clears throat> homosexuality is illegal, we didn't do anything with this programme in the first year. It was considered unthinkable. In the second year, our country director used senior members of a national team to have a conversation with staff to discuss how they felt about LGBTQI plus and simply listen to them. In year three, the senior team invited a UK based national of the country who was an LGBTQI plus campaigner to talk to staff about his personal experience of being beaten and imprisoned at home and seeking asylum in the UK. Moved by this personal story, staff in the office built rapport with him, asked questions, got to know him, took selfies. And the following year, the teams organised with the British Embassy in this country to host an event for LGBTQI plus organisations in the country around this film. And next time, we actually plan to do something in the office. The approach here is one we take so much in our work, start where people are, work with local partners as far as possible, and provide space for safe and culturally sensitive discussion. It's interesting that following this work, a number of people identified as being bisexual or homosexual in our staff diversity monitoring, whereas hitherto 100% had identified as heterosexual. If this exercise has resulted in those members of our teams feeling safer and more comfortable about declaring their identity without fear of repercussions, then we've moved quite some way forward. Can you move the slide on please, Natasha? So we're moving on now to challenges presented by COVID. To state the obvious, COVID-19 has turned the world upside down, bringing enormous changes to the way we live and work. In terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, this has brought a number of challenges, but also opportunities. Let's start with the challenges. Socioeconomic inequalities. There are vast differences between the ways COVID-19 has been experienced by different groups, with poorer communities, including dif different ethnic groups, disproportionately impacted in terms of health and well-being. Many have experienced lockdown in small, overcrowded accommodation or have been unable to work from home because of the very nature of their work. And even if they can technically work from home, people on lower incomes may not have the living space, equipment, or set up at home in order to do so. Then let's move to gender inequalities. There may be some leveling opportunities here too, but let's start with the challenges. It's a truth that still in the 21st century, women often undertake the lion's share of unpaid work in the household, including care, caring responsibilities for children or indeed elders. Being at home and struggling to juggle work and homeschooling and other caring responsibilities frequently affects women disproportionately. 
mental health and well-being. The office and workplace provide social spaces as well as workplaces for people. Removing this risks causing loneliness, isolation and mental health issues. This can cause problems for anyone, but has been particularly felt by young people. And finally, managing the unknown. Leaders are having to deal with a situation they have never faced before and have had to learn a whole new set of skills in leading and motivating teams, pretty much on the hoof. Can I have a next slide, please, Natasha? So let's think about how we can address some of these challenges, but also embrace opportunities that they bring. Firstly, COVID-19 has made us reassess the need for fixed office assets. And there's widespread agreement that the future world of work will be hybrid, with some time spent in a shared space and some working from home. We can help address social inequalities and isolation by making sure that we get the balance right between home working and coming together and also helping people get the right tools for the trade at home, be that a proper desk, chair, mouse, monitor, etc. And employers can help with that. I think we need to really rethink flexibility. The demands placed on people, often women, in juggling home and work duties means that we as managers and leaders need to reassess presence requirements, review the concept of core hours, for example, and look at facilitating as much flexibility as possible. This should also challenge a hitherto norm where presenteeism was associated with opportunities for promotion and advancement. Greater flexibility could actually improve the situation for women overall, and as some have pointed out, take away the need often faced by women to make a choice between paid work and caring responsibilities. The third thing I think we need to do is to encourage acceptance of the whole self. Encouraging people to bring their whole selves to work has been a stalwart in the drive for equality, diversity and inclusion. And in my own context, is often cited as a reason why colleagues appreciate the British Council, especially in societies with more traditional values. COVID-19 has shown that this is even more important. We can all remember how we laughed at that clip of the BBC reporter in Korea being interrupted by his to toddlers bursting into the room just a few years ago. But now this is normal for pretty much all of us. We've all borne witness to tots popping up or teenagers slithering across the floor commando style at the back of a Zoom call. Um, and so what? We've survived. Work and family life can coexist. We've seen today I would have carried on making a terrible noise with these papers had not an enterprising 15-year-old crept in behind me and given me a piece of paper to alert me to that. We need to show compassion, empathy, and a focus on well-being. Never before have leaders and managers needed to be so mindful of well-being in their teams, with the need to be supportive and empathetic to their colleagues and show compassion and kindness, from checking in with individuals, holding informal coffee sessions on Zoom, etc. As we move more into hybrid ways of working, this, in my view, will stick and become an ever more important feature of good management. I think we need to remember, as we've discussed before, the importance of systems, processes and cross-checking. 
We've all had to make decisions very quickly in COVID, sometimes on the hoof. This may not have allowed for the full implementation of the kind of assessment tools we discussed earlier. We should, however, remind colleagues of the importance of assessing the potential, of, uh, potential impact of decisions on different groups. In the British Council, for example, we have an EDI checklist in place for use where we may not have the opportunity to put in a full equality screening and impact assessment. We need to rethink places of work. We've already discussed the hybrid model and maybe in future we will need different kinds of spaces that will look and feel different to the current office spaces we have now and that focus, for example, entirely on collaboration and on bringing people together in a more social way uh, while they sit at their desks at home. And finally, one of the opportunities that I think COVID has presented to us is that it's shown us that being in different geographical spaces, including countries and continents, does not have to be a barrier for successful delivery of results. It has shown how easily teams who wouldn't normally work together can be brought together to address tasks and develop new ideas uh, together on, on new ways of working. We've also seen how things that we assumed could only be delivered face to face can now be delivered digitally. And we all adapted to that with such speed. In my own work, I've seen colleagues in Argentina deliver projects in Jamaica, colleagues in Cuba deliver admin support in Canada, and colleagues from across the 13 countries in, in my region, from different verticals, different pay bands, come together in little task forces to work on new ideas for the delivery of our programmes, the development of our programmes, and innovative ways of working in the future. So I suppose in conclusion, Natasha, last slide please. As I fire off an email and catch sight of my signature at the bottom, I often think about the little working class girl from Birmingham, the opportunities I have been given to help me get where I am today, and how important it is that I, and indeed all leaders and managers, continue to provide opportunities for greater equality, diversity and inclusion in our work. COVID-19 has thrown new challenges our way, but also new opportunities to completely rethink our practice and make EDI an ever more important part of effective management. Thank you very much. I hope I've left plenty of time for questions and I look forward to them. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, there's a lot of comments. We particularly liked your analogy about the fish pond because um, it's so true. We're just by changing the colours, the water stays the same. So absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for that. So we do have a few pre-submitted questions um, and one or two that have come through the live chat. So if I go to the pre-submitted questions first of all, um, I have a question here. What is the interface between EDI and anti-racism? Okay, I think for me these are part and parcel of a holistic, inclusive approach. Um, and I see that uh, anti-racism and and working against discrimination uh, on the grounds of race is as important as working against the discrimination on the grounds of age, on the grounds of gender, on the grounds of sexual orientation, etc. However, I think what 
what what the the what COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement has shown is that many of us have not moved at the same pace or at the pace that we would have liked to on anti-racism in the workplace. And I think that means that we have some catching up to do. So, for example, in the British Council, we have set up our senior leadership team, has set up an anti-racism task force that includes colleagues from around the global network, as well as a challenge group to hold us all to account. Um, does that mean that we are saying that this is the most important element of our uh, uh, EDI work? I, d I don't think it is. I think it, what it's saying is that we've got some catching up to do and we really need to put some extra effort in here to get to where we want to be. But ultimately, if we want to be organisations that are truly inclusive, then all of those elements need to be considered. OK, and just in relation to that, a question's just come in because um, obviously you've mentioned George, George Floyd quite a bit. Um, and the question is, it's mentioned that the murder of George, George Floyd is a turning point. Why was it the murder of Stephen Lawrence a driver for change? Just your reflections and thoughts on that. Um, I, think, I think the answer is it absolutely should have been. And indeed, the murder of, of countless other young black people since then um, I think what, what the murder of George Floyd brought to the fore, I think, was the importance of social media and real-time real news for galvanising people into action. Um, and I think that has been unprecedented, I think, in terms of, as I mentioned before, the number of organisations who just recognise that we're not doing enough. And, you know, the recent UUK report into UK universities and saying that they're not doing enough. Um, and this idea, I mentioned it earlier, it, good intentions isn't just isn't enough. We have to have some rigour applied to these things to make a difference. And I sincerely hope that if people stick to the rigour and to things that are achievable and sustainable, um, rather than uh, necessarily uh, rushing out to do lots of things that feel good and make people feel that they're doing something, but which actually don't really make a difference. It goes back to the, the fish in the pond, you know, let's really change the water. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I'll go back um, to a pre-submitted question. Um, what do you believe can be achieved regarding EDI now that has failed to be realised to date? So, again, I'm going back to the thing I've just said, really. I think there is momentum now um, to really change and really deliver results. Um, you know, you, the audience today, uh, you know, will be working in business if they're not working in business already. We wouldn't expect our businesses to be more profitable simply by saying we're going to be more profitable next year. We have all sorts of robust measures in place in order to ensure that our businesses do well. Uh, our leaders in business are accountable to business success. They must show how what they, uh, their leadership is delivering profits or whatever the measures are for that business success. And in the same way, I think that EDI needs to be treated as any other business measure uh, where we bring in that rigour we get the right data. We look at the systems for monitoring and measuring our performance. And those, I think, will lead to results. And in terms of where we are now, what I was saying about uh, the, the times and the, uh, 
the social media and the real life news and something that you know young people around the world will no longer tolerate as i said before you know young people really value equality and diversity and will expect organizations around the world to show their commitment to that that coupled with covid that has shown us actually we can deliver things in all sorts of ways that we didn't think possible before and actually we can be really flexible we can find ways in giving people choice and opportunities without actually compromising business performance so i think the creative opportunities coming from covid um, as well as this particular time i am very hopeful that organizations will find ways to change the water in that point excellent and then just one final question which i think is quite interesting um, i've got a question here what do you believe is the be best practice for ensuring edi in the recruitment process so like job descriptions the adverts okay so i would say putting all of those things um through a, an objective system or tool for evaluating whether those job descriptions are really being as inclusive as possible. Is there any danger that that job description is, is uh, discouraging to certain groups to apply or might rule certain groups out? And I think applying the rigor of that objective tool so in the british council we pulled together a panel that's based uh made up of uh people from different backgrounds to look at these kind of things to assess whether they are as inclusive as they can be um and then to think about where we are advertising what are we doing the example i gave of brazil was a really simple example that just something we had just done for a long time as a matter of habit and just questioning that and just saying actually is that thing that we're doing now reaching the widest group of people um i think can really be really be powerful in changing uh in changing uh the the diversity and the inclusivity of teams um, in our own practice currently, for example, we generally require in the British Council a certain level of English language competence. And that's something now I'm looking with my own teams at saying, actually, do we really need that high level or could we take people at entry with lower levels and then provide training and support? And would that enable us to reach a wider group of people who could come and work for us. So it's about that interrogation, I think, of the way we do things. Fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, and if I may, I have a question myself, so I'm going to cheat you a little bit. I don't know if the host is going to ask a question, but I am interested in your thoughts. Um, to what extent do you think we've come down the track whereby EDI is real in organisations and not just a tick box to say, look, this is what we're doing. We've got a diverse executive board. We've got a diverse you know, senior management team. So from your experience, your research and your reflections, is it really happening or do you think it's a tick box because of our brand image? Um. My honest view is uh, that it is happening. And if, uh, you know, I would strongly recommend uh, folks read the McKinsey report and actually look at what uh, those top companies who really value equality and diversity and inclusion, what they are really doing to change cultures in their organisations and how they are being successful as a result. So I think it is happening. Uh, I think it isn't happening uh, as widely uh, and as deeply as we would like it to. Um, so I think uh, that point that I made about turning uh, good intentions into results, uh, good intentions aren't good enough. Uh, and the point I just made about, you know, we wouldn't expect 
business performance in any other way to be based on uh, warm words from the CEO. Uh, and similarly, you know, organisations must put in those measures. And, you know, I think the McKinsey report really shows what a difference those measures make to actual business performance. Brilliant. Well, Helen, thank you ever so much. Absolutely fantastic presentation. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Claire um, with some conclusive comments. So, Claire. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Helen, it was our pleasure to listen to you this evening and to share your fascinating insights. You've left us all with a lot to think about in terms of our own practice. Now, if we were all together, we at this point, I would hand over to a colleague who would have hand me a piece of glasswork that's been commissioned by one of our students. And this year, we've done the same. We will somehow get this to you. But Jessica McKay is one of our MA students and she produced a beautiful piece of glasswork for you, as a, just as a token of our thanks. So um, look, look forward to that. We'll be in touch about how to get that to you. It takes a lot of people to organise an event like this, and especially this year with moving it online. Uh, and I would like to thank the team behind the scenes, particularly Nikki Robinson, for all her hard work, but also to the CMI team who've been absolutely fantastic. It's been a pleasure to do this, even if we are across the world from each other. So thank you very much. And thank you especially to Dilshad and to the CMI board for all their support over the years now we look forward to our 28th year next year i do also want to thank kevin croker who's our mba director for supporting our students and congratulations to lizzie and all our finalists so thank you for joining us i hope you've enjoyed this evening we've really enjoyed spending time with you and i wish you all a lovely evening <laughs>